Welcome to the Climate Recap from the Beckosphere Climate Corner, your go-to place for international and U.S.-based climate news. I'm Becky Hogue, a climate communicator. Click the subscribe button and ring the bell icon to stay updated on this very important topic, and let's jump right into today's news. In 2020, 30% of the world's electricity came from renewable sources, which does not include nuclear power. Including nuclear power would bring the percentage up to 40%. 66 or 31% of countries ran mostly on renewables, and 7 or 4% of the countries ran mostly on nuclear. Renewables increased their slice of the pie from less than 5% to 30% in just the last. 10 years. And now, due to policy changes in the three top emitters, the US, China, and India, as well as Europe warming up to clean energy due to high gas prices, the International Energy Agency recently updated its global renewable power capacity outlook to reflect a much faster adoption rate moving forward. The IEA is an internationally respected autonomous intergovernmental organization meant to provide policy recommendations, data, and analysis on global energy. It was originally created to monitor fossil fuel industry trends in the 70s, but now it looks at all energy sources. The IEA sees renewable energy represent over 90% of global energy growth over the next five years and overtake coal to become the largest largest energy source by early 2025. In 2019, coal represented over 38% of the global energy supply. This means that global solar photovoltaic capacity will triple by 2027 to become the main global power source. Global wind capacity is projected to double by then. This projection is 30% more optimistic than the previous rendition, and this change mainly comes, again, as the response of high gas prices in Europe and recent policy changes made in the world's three top emitters. Did this global electricity projection surprise you? Let me know in the comment section below. I honestly wasn't sure what I would expect but it's pretty cool to me, honestly. Switching to clean energy is big, but a needed change for the energy system so we don't cook ourselves. And it's important these clean energy projects are backed up with long duration energy storage. Well, for the US, the Energy Information Administration expects to see utility companies triple their battery storage capacity by 2025. So that's the EIA, not to be confused with the IEA that we just talked about before. For clarification, currently only 7.8 gigawatts of battery storage is on the grid, but at the end of 2025, we will have at least 30 gigawatts. More than three fourths of this growth is expected to take place in sunny California and Texas. How very bipartisan. What do you think of this battery storage capacity projection? The UK just opened its first new coal mine in 30 years. <laughs> So this move is pissing off the world. The mine, which was heavily debated for more than three years, will produce coking coal for steel production. The approval of this project directly goes against the nation's plans to reach net zero emissions by 2050 and is seen as a clear sign of hypocrisy by many developing nations. For example, the Liberian Minister of Works shared the mine approval news on Twitter saying, quote, Britain approves first new coal mine in decades despite climate targets. But it's Africa's negligible use of natural gas that would threaten the world's climate budget, right? The UK hosted last year's UN climate talks and has been a loud voice in the push away from fossil fuels. This mine announcement came around the same time the dispute on onshore wind development softened, suggesting this could potentially have been part of a political concession. For context on the other recent thing, the UK government was up in arms about whether to ease harsh restrictions on building onshore wind, mainly in Britain. Right now, turbines can only be built on pre-designated land, but a proposed change in the rule would allow turbines to be built anywhere with local government approval. So the ease of restrictions came in exchange of the coal mine, potentially. I'm not sure for sure, but it just seemed coincidental uh, those two things happened at the same time. Many environmental advocates say increasing coking coal supply is not necessary for steel production if instead the UK embraces cleaner steel production methods. During the mine's planning process, climate activists pointed out that the IEA projection, that's the first one, the IEA, saw the global demand for coking coal drop by 88% by 2050. That's because hydrogen, hopefully made using clean energy or nuclear, will replace it in powering heavy into 
industry. Hydrogen can replace coke and coal in steel production by reducing the iron pellets into sponge iron or metallic iron to be processed to form steel. Right now this process is done using high temperature stoked from burning coke and coal. Green steel technology is still quite new so the UK didn't want to risk their steel industry on it. But what do you think of green steel or of the UK's new mine? or of the onshore wind debate that they had. If you're from England, let me know in the comment section below why that thing? Why was that the thing that people were stressing out about so much? Because wind in the UK would just make sense, but let me know. Krakow, the second largest city in Poland, now has the second worst air quality in the world behind New Delhi, India, due to increased coal use in Europe. This stems from Russia's invasion in Ukraine and Europe's subsequent boycott of Russian oil and gas, as well as the winter setting in. In response to less access to Russian fossil fuels, Poland reduced restrictions on selling coal waste, which pollutes even more than burning coal, and dropped a two-year ban on the use of lignite, or brown coal, which contains several times more sulfur and ash and five times more mercury than black coal. A combo of sulfur and ash can cause asthma lung cancer, cardiac arrest, and stroke. They also make it easier for mercury to enter the lungs. All bad news, but Poland's desperate to just burn anything for heat. Poland also delayed a ban on a type of outdated furnace that is so poisonous it's called a smoker. The ban was supposed to go into effect starting next year. 40% of households in Krakow have a smoker furnace. Poland is one of the dirtiest grids in Europe, and these relaxed restrictions are a huge step back in the progress of making it more clean. These relaxed restrictions could also lead to over a thousand premature deaths this winter. It's time for a Rue break featuring Rue. Time for fun facts about Rue. Right, Rue? Here is a fun fact about Rue. Rue has a favorite window and that was a fun fact about Rue. EU regulators formally agreed to a new law that would ban any products from EU markets that have ties to deforestation or the degradation of forests. A 2016 report by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, or FAO, found that EU consumption was responsible for 10% of global deforestation. Much of this deforestation is tied to agriculture industries like beef, palm oil, Coca-Cola, Coca, <laughs> cocoa, <laughs> I can't say that. Much of this deforestation is tied to agriculture industries like beef, palm oil, cocoa, soy, coffee, and timber. The law was specific on which goods they were targeting, and all of these are on the list, including rubber, leather, chocolate, furniture, charcoal, and paper. The most notable items that were not included are biofuel and corn, but these could be added in the future. The new law will require all companies to issue a due diligence statement in order to sell these products on the EU market. This will involve providing satellite data or GPS coordinates of where the products are made. How common inspections will be will depend on the producing country, with the most risky country seeing 9% of its operators and traders trading products checked. The law also expands the definition of deforestation to include the conversion of primary forests or turning a naturally grown forest into a plantation forest where all the trees are the same age. Those types of forests are more susceptible to wildfires and disease. The law also attaches human rights protections by requiring companies to comply with the production country's human rights and indigenous laws. Well, relying on the production country's laws instead of like the EU's laws means that these rights will probably not necessarily be consistent, but it might add more pressure to the production countries to step it up. Environmental groups like Greenpeace and the World Wild Fund for Nature, or WWF, praise this law as historic and game-changing for forest conservation and building an ethical supply chain. The senior forest policy officer at the WWF European Policy Office said this in a statement, quote, We have made history with this world's first law against deforestation. The EU will not only change the rules of the games for consumption within its borders, but will also create a big incentive for other countries fueling deforestation to change their policies. The law will come into effect 20 days after it's formally adopted by the European Parliament and EU countries, which is expected to happen next year. But then there will be more grace period for companies to adjust, and so it will not apply to big and medium-sized companies until 18 months after the bill is passed and micro and small companies for 24 months after. And then in a year after that, the EU will need to go back and see if this law should be expanded to include all woody environments. And then in 
two years, it will need to go back to decide whether or not to expand the law to include important carbon storing or biodiversity rich ecosystems like wetlands and grasslands. What do you think of this new law? Let me know in the comment section below, especially if you live in the EU. The Canadian media company The Narwhal obtained a quietly collected list of hundreds of contaminated sites across Alberta, Canada, information that was withheld from the public by the Alberta Energy Regulator since 2019. These sites have enough levels of oil and gas contamination to harm the environment and or public safety. Of the at least 577 sites the regulator monitored, 400 of them are potentially high risk sites. These sites are contaminated through either active or idle fossil fuel infrastructure. Idle ones can actually be worse because they're not checked on as much, so spills are caught later. This information was kept between the higher ups for years until Narwhal paid the obligatory $25 fee to force the regulatory body to release documents. That's actually a requirement by law that if you give them 25 bucks, they have to give you the documents which is pretty cool. But the Alberta Energy Regulator heavily redacted the documents saying the numbers were part of confidential advice needed to make decisions in the future about aging fossil fuel sites. Luckily, the Office of Information and Privacy Commissioner disagreed with the regulator and forced them to provide the papers with less redactions. This behavior lines up with previous actions by the fossil fuel state. The Alberta government has let fossil fuel companies walk away from more than 600 sites between 2003 and 2019 without having to clean them up. And those are just the ones within 10 kilometers of either Calgary, Edmonton, or Red Deer. Taxpayers may have to foot the bill for at least seven of those sites cleanups because companies didn't provide cleanup money before going bankrupt. That's a very common method by fossil fuel companies to avoid cleaning up is just they, they go bankrupt. These numbers seem kind of low to me because Alberta has nearly half a million oil and gas wells on its land and more than 170,000 of them are inactive or abandoned. But I'll pass the story off to you now. Do you think that it was right for the Alberta Energy Regulator to withhold this information? Are any Albertans surprised by these findings? Let me know down below. The Keystone Pipeline just leaked enough oil in Kansas to fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool. That's the most crude oil to leak on land in the U.S in nine years and the biggest in Keystone Pipeline history. You might recognize the name Keystone from the Keystone XL Pipeline project, which was heavily protested by American landlords, indigenous groups, and environmental activists for a decade. That pipeline would have connected to this existing one, cutting a pathway through Montana and Nebraska. This would have crossed through several important ecosystems, threatened waterways with the potential of spills, and increased the further demand for crude oil, furthering our reliance on this particularly dirty kind of fossil fuels. President Biden and the Canadian fossil fuel giant TC Energy announced the Keystone XL pipeline project was dead last year, but the original Keystone pipeline still delivers 600,000 barrels of crude oil a day to refineries in Texas, Illinois, and Oklahoma from the Alberta tar sands. The pipeline spilled 14,000 barrels of crude oil into a nearby creek that feeds rural pasture lands. While this is by far the largest spill the pipeline has had, data from the US Government Accountability Office shows 22 other spills since the pipeline was built in 2010. These 22 spills added up to an additional 12,000 barrels spilled in local waterways. Tar sand oil is denser than other types of oil, so it can sink down to the bottom of water bodies instead of floating to the top, making it harder to clean up. It also is more toxic. The cleanup process could take months or even years to complete. Congress will soon debate about reauthorizing regulatory programs, and the chair of the House Subcommittee on Pipeline Safety said he's taken note of that spill. TC Energy and the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, said the spill was contained. What do you think of this spill and whether or not it means anything? Let me know in the comment section below. Los Angeles unanimously voted to immediately ban new oil wells and will also phase out all oil drilling over the next 20 years. The city was pretty much built on the petroleum industry and currently has 26 oil and gas fields and more than 5,000 oil and gas wells some active and some idle. These wells are known to likely emit carcinogens and people living near them have higher rates of respiratory illness and preterm births. Despite this growing body of research, the California Independent Petroleum Association, a trade group representing more than 300 oil and gas producers, penned a letter to the city council in October disputing the health implications of living near fossil fuel drilling and production sites. I welcome the writers of that letter to live near one of them. Stand Together Against Neighborhood Drilling or Stand L 
LA, a coalition of community groups that helped to form this new bill, was relieved to see the ruling pass, saying, quote, Black, Latinx, and other communities of color currently living near polluting oil wells and derricks in South LA and Wilmington will eventually breathe easier. A few days after this ruling, LA and San Diego went after another fossil fuel-based product, polystyrene, starting next April. That's the foam plastic that's used to make single-use to-go containers, dishes, and coffee cups. Exceptions were made for polystyrene, products like surfboards and coolers if it was encased in a more durable material. This ban has been in the works for years, a tireless effort by environmental groups because this stuff breaks down easily into microplastic pieces and is listed under probably carcinogenic by the World Health Organization. LA and San Diego's bans are two of the largest in California, but join 158 ordinances on the books by cities and counties across the state. Hundreds of jurisdictions have banned it across the U.S., including eight states altogether. Businesses seem capable of adjusting to this. California as a whole will actually soon become the ninth state to ban this type of plastic after the Plastic Pollution Producer Responsibility Act also passed earlier this year. This climate recap is sponsored by me. <laughs> if you would like to get climate news in different formats, I got you. I'm on TikTok and Instagram as well as on Twitch. And I have my own podcast, which just basically is the audio version of these climate recaps. So if any of those interest you, all the links are down below. Please check them out. If you like the work I do and want to monetarily support me, you can buy me a cup of coffee via buy me a coffee or uh, join my Patreon for as little as $3 a month. So definitely check out both of those options if you would like to support me and my fur baby Roo. The financial giant Vanguard became the largest member to quit the Net Zero Asset Manager initiative a subunit of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. GFANS is the world's largest climate finance alliance, and it was formed at the UN Climate Conference COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland in 2021. It represents about 550 members holding $150 trillion in assets. Members need to promise to create plans that line up their portfolios and their companies with the Paris Accord, meaning both need to drop emitting activities by 2050. Vanguard said they removed themselves from the group to help provide the clarity our investors deserve desire about everything from the role of index funds to financial risks in the context of climate change. It also said it didn't want to limit its financial options like decarbonizing its portfolio by a certain time frame. This is just the latest move by large financial corporations, particularly ones based in the U.S., to backtrack climate action. And this is mainly due to efforts by the U.S. Republican states like Texas, Florida, and West Virginia to punish and divest from companies who even mention they want to provide environmental social and governance or ESG portfolio options that don't have fossil fuels included. BlackRock is the company that we hear about the most being targeted for these ESG reforms. Those pushing back against ESG reform argue that excluding fossil fuels from these funds is discrimination, but more consumers are just looking to invest their money into options that don't include fossil fuels. So it, they're kind of just listening to market trends. Additionally, decarbonizing implies fossil fuels will become stranded assets in the future, so it makes sense from a shareholder value perspective to divest from them. Unless, of course, your shareholders are also only thinking short term, which the Vanguard letter kind of suggested. While receiving outside pressure, banks are also experiencing inside pressure by not properly putting their money where their mouth is. Collecting and analyzing emissions data from every asset takes a lot of time, workers, and money, something firms heavily underestimated or didn't prioritize. Removing themselves from the agreement keeps them from being accused of greenwashing themselves in the future. So if the private sector and the GOP don't want the market to lead the climate finance and divestment movement, that leaves it up to the government. Government, right? The GOP has already expressed interest in handicapping the Securities and Exchange Committee, the U.S. body in charge of market regulation. Very interesting. So what do you think of this situation? Should the public or private sector be in charge of divesting from fossil fuels? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. What kind of punishment seems appropriate for climate activists that peacefully block traffic in protest? Let me know below what you think.
Recently, Deanna Violet Coco was given a 15-month prison sentence after blocking a single lane of traffic on Sydney's Harbour Bridge in New South Wales, Australia during a climate protest in April. She and two other activists parked their two cars on the road, lit flares, and held signs calling for urgent climate action. They live-streamed their whole protest. It took 25 minutes for police to arrest them and remove the barrier. Coco ended up having to plead guilty to seven charges which added up to a 15-month jail sentence with eight months of no parole. The magistrate claimed the climate activist had made the entire city suffer with her selfish emotional actions. Quote, you do damage to your cause when you do childish stunts like this. A UN official on human rights and Coco's lawyer called this sentencing disproportional. Quote, Australia. I am alarmed at New South Wales court's prison term against climate protester Deanna Coco and refusal to grant bail until March 2023 appeal hearing. Peaceful protesters should never be criminalized or imprisoned. Coco sentencing caused small protests to erupt around Australia. This is just the latest anti-activist rhetoric shilled by the New South Wales government officials, and it also reflects growing anti-activist behavior by governments around the world. Coco did say that she will appeal her sentence, so we will have to keep an eye on that to see how it goes. In more positive Australian activist news, the Queensland Indigenous Women's Rangers Network received the $1.8 million or £1 million Revive the Ocean's Earthshot Prize for its work in protecting the Great Barrier Reef. Earthshot Prizes were made by David Attenborough and Prince William in 2020 to be the Nobel Prize of Environmental Work. Indigenous Rangers use 60,000 years of First Nations knowledge and digital technology to monitor the oceans and coastline. This is just one of many examples of why 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is on the land at least partially controlled by indigenous people. Right now, only 20% of these rangers are women, so the Queensland Indigenous Women's Rangers Network aims to inspire indigenous women to get more involved in the conservation effort. The data collected by the network has helped preserve the famous reef. The network also goes beyond Queensland, working to connect indigenous women from island and isolated locations around the world to share conservation knowledge and technology. Congratulations to the group. And that was your climate recap for the day. If you want more news, there's a whole honorable mentions sub list that's connected to my main source list linked below. Remember to talk about the climate crisis every single day and to support your local news organizations. Thank you so much to the people on Patreon who help support me and my fur baby Rue. A special shout out to the climate confident and courageous David H., Norman and all, Greg H., Paul B., Phil Plasma, Dan Morton, Dane Chris, Nate, Specker, Bree C., Climate Teacher John J., Deanne, and Steve. I greatly appreciate your support of $5 or more. If you would like to support the Becca Sphere, please check out the Patreon and buy me a coffee. Links in the description below for recurring or one-time payments. Bye for now.